thank you so much for being with us and for accepting this um, uh, conversation because more than an interview, it's a, a conversation and we would love you to share your um, teaching experiences uh, with other teachers uh, here in the south of Mexico. So it's, it's an you honor want to, to be with you. Oh, thank you. Um, I would like you to introduce yourself. What are you doing right now? Where do you teach? Okay. Yeah. Uh, my name is Carmela Valdez. I live in Austin, Texas. Um, I teach first grade dual language at Perez Elementary, um, which is in South Austin. Um, I teach dual language, so um, hablamos en dos idiomas. Tenemos que enseñar en inglés y también en español. Uh, mis alumnos tienen como seis, siete años. Uh, ahorita ellos están en casa como yo, pero um, that I have been teaching, I think this is my 14th year, but I don't remember, I lose track. <laughs> uh, I wait till they tell me happy 15 years. Um, and uh, let's see. Yeah, I think yeah. that's it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Wait, tell me more about this dual uh, language context. How is it to teach uh, little ones because you're teaching the little ones? And how is it to teach uh, two languages for these kids? Um, I think it's amazing. So uh, I, I think I, I should probably tell you a little bit about myself. So um, when I, my parents um, growing up only spoke Spanish at home. They were born here in the United States, but their families only spoke Spanish. And then I'm, I'm pretty old. So they're, my mom is up there. Uh, but uh, it's, but when they went to school in the United States, they were not allowed to speak Spanish. They were only made to speak English. Uh, my mom um, said that she got in trouble one time because she used a Spanish word in class and they put her in the corner. They made her, they, she was uh, castigado. She was like in, she was in trouble. And my dad, when he tried to go to school, they wouldn't let him in school because he didn't speak English. So he went to Catholic school mm -hmm. um, and they, the nuns taught in, in English and Spanish there. And my mother told me that she didn't understand anything that was happening in school until fifth grade, 10 wow. years old. Um, and so uh, hearing that growing up, um, I went to a school that was, I went to Catholic school and I learned two languages. And then I went to regular school, which was one language, only English. And I felt like I lost a lot of my Spanish. So, uh, and I was really embarrassed about that. Um, so when I wanted to be a teacher after the things that brought me to teaching, um, I, wanted to teach the students that were my parents who spoke Spanish at home. And I wanted to value that so that maybe to correct the wrongs that when my parents were told not to speak Spanish, I would never ever tell a student not to speak their language. And then I wanted to teach the students that were me too, that were the ones who at home, they spoke Spanish, but um, they spoke both languages together. So um, our dual language program, which is different than a, another bilingual classroom, our dual language program teaches, ours particularly teaches half of the day uh, in English and half of the day in Spanish. It's kind of weird the way we broke it up. So what we do is we teach uh, science, social studies, and uh, language arts, arts in Spanish. Entonces, lectura y escritura en español. Ciencias y Estudios Sociales. Luego, también hacemos, we also do reading and writing in English and math in English. And so we do both of those things. And we value the, the languages that the students bring to us. And um, which is different than what my parents experienced and a little bit different than what I experienced. So, um, that's sort of the context of that. So I wanted to make sure to 
I, I don't know, I guess I wanted to be a, a, a dual language teacher to right the wrongs that happened before and then to move forward with the students that were like me. Um, unfortunately, we still have a lot of work to do because I think some people don't always value uh, what students bring. And I think there's a lot of prejudice and maybe some racism involved. And, and uh, but we wanna make sure that uh, people are valued and know that uh, their cultures yeah. and their lives are honored. Tell me, how was, um, or how did you decide to be a teacher, to become a teacher? Uh, do you have teachers in your family or how was your, your path towards teaching? Well, that's a good question. I, um, when I went to, my parents were teachers. Yeah. Uh, so I think they also wanted to teach the kids that they were, right? So they went to be a teacher because they knew that education was really important. And uh, they felt that they, after having had prejudice in their lives, they felt that uh, education was a way to equalize things, right? To put them on uh, the same level as, as other people. And so they, um, so they were teachers. So I, I originally didn't want to be a teacher. When I went to college, I went to college for theater. Um, mm -hmm. I am, uh, I have my undergraduate degree, my bachelor's degree is in theater. And I used to work in theater. I, I wasn't an actor or anything. I was sort of, I was a stage manager. I was the bossy person who told people what to do. Um, but, um, and so I worked in theater for a long time and I loved it. I think that the arts are really important. And I think that theater is a magical way to communicate um, stories and um, open people's hearts and minds. Uh, but I, I sort of felt like what I was doing in theater, I, 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 I didn't know that that was the right fit for me. So Uh, a friend of mine in theater, a musician, was uh, getting his, finishing his degree in teaching. And I didn't want to teach high school because I just, it just didn't feel like me. I don't know. Maybe, I don't know, maybe someday, but not then. Um, and, uh, and so I went and he was teaching little kids and he was uh, going to be a music teacher for little kids. And so I thought, hey, maybe I should be a, a bilingual teacher for for little kids. And I went to, um, I, I applied for, uh, to get my master's and, uh, they had us in the classroom right away. And, um, and I loved it. It was awesome. The kids are amazing and they're smart and they're cute and they want to, their hearts are open and it's awesome. Wow. Do you have a lot of uh, Latin students? I do. I have, Uh, I right now I have 17 students in my class and I think about um, let's see uh, like four of them speak mostly English at home the rest come from Spanish speaking homes what has been one of your best experiences as a teacher um let's see if I can say this without crying um <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm a big Yorona, by the way. Uh, Because I don't know if in, in, in the United States um, it's the same, but we are celebrating Teachers Day here. So, oh, yeah. we, had, we had, it was ours was last week. It was very nice. Oh, um, okay. Um, let's see. I had a student last year. This is, there's a lot of them. I mean, there's, you know, when kids like, learn how to read and they sort of get it and their eyes get excited and that's really awesome but I think I had a last year I had a student who came from Honduras mm -hmm. and he came on a very very dangerous journey with his mom and he um uh it was the stories he told were really really scary and he came uh to our class and he's a little bit older and a little bit bigger Uh, but was in first grade and um, you could tell that he had he had seen a lot of things that the other kids hadn't seen right he had experienced trauma and um, but uh, he so smart and so sweet and so kind and he just wanted to fit in but I was able to with 
my students, I was able to, and the writer's workshop that, that we do to help him uh, tell his story and to feel like his story was important and to feel like um, that he fit in and he wasn't ashamed anymore of the journey that he had been on or, uh, and so that was really um, important to me. He told me, um, he struggled with like writing stuff down because he hadn't had a lot of schooling because it was really dangerous in, in Honduras. And he told me, he said, tu eres mi maestra hasta el fin del mundo. Oh. And I carry that in my heart with me. It's just so, that's yeah. pretty special. How do you use um, art, language, and culture uh, with your students or in your lessons? Bueno, muchas de, de las lecciones están en español porque es importante que los niños tienen los dos idiomas presentes y, um, y para mí es importante que en los libros but, de, tenemos, bueno, lectura y también escritura. Y en lectura que es importante para mí que um, estamos leyendo libros donde los niños pueden ver a su cultura y su idioma y su carita, y su color uh, en los libros. Sí, porque para que sepan que no todo es para una cultura, para un niño, que hay otros niños representados en, en los libros que leímos. Um, entonces, los libros que estudiamos como lectores tienen dos idiomas, tienen algunas más, algunas tenemos uh, palabras de indígenas, algunas, bueno, muchas muchos colores uh, representados y es importante que estudiamos eso como lectores y también como escritores y miramos cómo personas que escriben en dos idiomas o tres idiomas uh -huh. cómo escriben qué son las estrategias qué son las cosas que, 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 que hagan en sus libros cómo usan dos idiomas uh, en sus libros uh, lo estudiamos en inglés y en español Uh, trato de hacer más en español para que, porque español es, es un idioma uh, lindo y, y también uh, es como poética, no sé, como mm -hmm. decir. pero, uh, so it's important for them to see themselves reflected in the stories that we read that we study as, as readers, that we study as writers. Um, and so the, that is art. And I think that also it's important that we talk about storytelling. I mean, any, I think art is just mm -hmm. telling a story, right? So Frida tells a story with her. I have Frida here. Uh, she's with me all the time. Frida <laughs> tells a story, you know, with her painting. Diego tells a story with his paintings and with his colors. And it's, and, you know, with writing, you can tell a story also. You can tell a story with dance, you, with theater. There's a million ways to do it. And so if a student wants to uh, tell their story um, in whatever way, is more powerful to them, I, I support that. And we try to, to, to do that. I personally love writing and drawing. I love kids, children's books, children's literature. I think it's beautiful. Um, and uh, so we do, we study a lot of that. Wow, that's really cool. So um, you, I was asking you about this project, the writing, uh, the heart of Texas writing project. Uh, can you tell us a little bit what it's about? Sure, about? of yeah. course. Um, so Heart of Texas Writing Project is associated with the National Writing Project. Um, and it, uh, it is uh, a group of teachers. It, the Heart of Texas Writing Project is a group of teachers who come together to um, find equity and find um, social justice through writer's workshop. Um, and a writer's workshop is uh, basically giving a, a mini lesson about what a strategy that a writer uses um, to tackle the blank page, to um, 
to uh, fix their work, to publish their work, whatever strategy that a writer might use. And then I give them time to write and to write what they wanna write about, not what I want them to write about. So they follow their own agendas. They write about their abuelas, they write about Pokemon, they write about whatever they wanna write about. And then we come back together and we uh, talk about how it went and we reflect and we share. Um, and during the writing time, I will talk to them one-on-one -on -one and say, and I get to say, what you did is beautiful. This is awesome. And, and I get to say, you know, writers do this, you know, writers do that. And I get to, to help them find the beauty in their work and the good things that they're doing and then move them forward as writers and have them um, try other things that they might be a little scared to try. Um, but I think the most important thing about Writer's Project, uh, a Writer's Workshop for me is that it is about students writing about what is important to them. And I think for me, that is social justice because instead of me telling you what to write and me telling you what's important, you tell me what's important to you. And you write about your life, your stories, your obsessions, your whatever you wanna write about. It's your, you know, your agenda and then, uh, and valuing that and that, you know, if a student, like I said, if a student wants to write about Pokemon and I've had a lot of kids write about Pokemon, mm -hmm. then they can write about Pokemon. But if a student wants to write, I have a student who is obsessed with todo en su escrituras de Navidad. En Navidad hacemos esto y mi mamá hace tamales y luego hay, uh, uh, podemos ver Noche Buena. Y, like, y todo, todo está, quiere, que quiere escribir es de, es de, Navidad, porque eso es que es importante a él. Eso es parte como él puede mirar y, uh, y cosas específicas de su cultura y eso es, y quiere y quiere um, quiere que eso se queda con él siempre. Um, so I let him write about it, and it's because other writers make lots of money writing about, you know. A, what their experiences in life. So why can't they do it? And so instead of like saying, oh, I like um, this book about dogs, they, they write their own book about dogs if that's what they want to do. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, how have the knowledge of two languages or in, let's say two different cultures and in, in, yeah, to have these two languages, uh, how have this contributed to your personal life? To like, for you as a person and as a teacher? Well, language is bigger than just one language. Algunas veces hay palabras en español que, que suena mejor que una palabra en inglés porque, o que quiere representar lo que, lo que estás pensando. Tienes que usar una palabra en español. Uh, o a veces, uh, porque tienes dos idiomas en tu cabeza, estás pensando en los dos y, di, y a veces olvido cómo decir otra palabra en inglés o en español y tengo que pensar en eso. Entonces, idioma es más grande, idioma doble idioma, porque estamos uh, viviendo en dos idiomas y no porque en, el, en nuestros cerebros solo no piensan, ok, ya voy a pensar en inglés, ya voy a pensar en español. Los dos están juntos y tengo uh, doble de, de que puede representar lo que quiero decir. Mi historia, lo uh, arte, lo que sea, tengo doble. Y si hablo tres idiomas, no puedo, pero luego tengo más. Es una riqueza. Exacto. And you were saying that before we started the, the live transmission, that um, es una riqueza apreciar la diferencia cultural. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's, I think that for a lot of times, a lot of years in the United States, not everybody's language and culture was honored and was, um, Oh, only like the majority language and culture was what was important. And, and I think everybody tried to get 
students to be like this one path, right? English speaking, English culture, like conform to this. But I think that that's wrong. I think that you live in your life, in your culture, and you change the world from there, right? You don't have to be like anybody else to change the world. You live in who you are right now and change the world from there and the world is a better place because of you. No, that's really beautiful. ¿Cuál es tu palabra favorita en español? Murcielagos. Because in English it's bat. <laughs> y eso me, para mí representa que algo en español que tiene que usar como tres sílabas para decir uno en inglés. Entonces, eh, si estoy escribiendo como una nota, padres, tengo que escribir en los dos idiomas, en inglés y en español. Siempre en español, más líneas. Porque para decir uh, algo en español, y a, a veces usas más palabras. Y como diálogo, <laughs> más sílabas que bat. And, well, uh, going back to the teaching experiences, which has been the most frustrating, like thing you have experienced during your teaching career? Well, we might have to do longer. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, I sometimes, I, so I get really frustrated for several things. And, and uh, the frustration continues because I think that the world is changing slowly. Sometimes I want it to change faster. So I get frustrated when people see Uh, multilingual students as as being at risk or being having a deficit. They don't. The state sometimes calls students who are learning English uh, limited, and I think that far from being limited, they they have like I said, like two worlds to live in, right? And even more than that. Um, so I get frustrated with the district when they uh, don't see the beauty of the language and culture and uh, honor that for my students. I also get really frustrated. One of my biggest frustrations right now, I think is that when teachers uh, look at students and they say, this kid can't even do this. That kid can't even, can't even read. That kid doesn't even know his letters, all of his letters. But maybe that kid knows letters in English and Spanish. So he knows more than this other kid, right? So I, I, instead of having that deficit mindset, the mindset, this kid can't do this. I get frustrated with that. And I really want teachers, new teachers, old teachers, because uh, sometimes the old teachers have the biggest problem with that, <laughs> is that, um, that to see what they bring. So see what your students and celebrate what your students bring uh, to you and find the joy and beauty in that instead of wanting them to, trying to fill them up with your knowledge. Yeah, and what about uh, teaching during this quarantine? How has uh, this experience been? Um, I, I, I see beautiful things when students are working at home with their families and they're more in touch with their families and they're writing about things that happen every day. That I think is beautiful. And that's something that hasn't happened in my classroom, that the family connection to their work is really powerful. And I think that that's meaningful to me. I get, and to them mostly, I get really frustrated when um, my students, there's expectations on my students and some of them don't have access to technology. Yeah. Um, so, you know, one student might have an iPad and a computer that he's working on at home and a parent who stays home all day with him. And then uh, another student whose mom, who only has a phone maybe, and whose mom works all day and then has to come home. And then I get Uh, assignments at nine and 10 o'clock at night saying, maestra, perdón que, que estoy haciendo esto tan tarde, pero estoy trabajando y luego trabajando con mi hijo. And I, I tell them, señora, no se preocupe. Lo que, lo que es mejor para su familia es lo más importante para mí. Mm -hmm. Vamos a seguir adelante con todo académico cuando regresamos, pero ustedes tienen que hacer lo que pueden. Y, y eso es que, que me preocupa mucho, es que padres están bien uh, preocupados de que sus niños no van a perder el año. 
El año, exacto. No van a perder información, no van a perder y, o van a regresar uh, atrasados que los otros niños. Y, y quiero decir que ahorita solo lo más importante es que cuidan a su familia y que todos se, se quedan uh, seguros y, y, y eso es más importante para mí. Yeah, and how do you do to motivate the kids? Because it's very hard. I was telling you that uh, working with little kids and make them to be motivated uh, to yeah. work on something uh, in the computer is like more complicated than having them in the classroom. It's, uh, I, I have had, and I was, excuse me, like I was telling you earlier, I've had like four parents this week and last week say, Maestra, puedo hablar con mi hijo porque no quiero hacer su tarea. And I get it. Like, it's almost the end of the school year. Uh, you know, it's hard to motivate yourself, especially if mom's not at home or because our, the, our little kids need more attention and more help on the computer to do stuff. Sure. And it's, and they also need more time to play, right? It's not all about just doing this for two hours. because I wouldn't make them sit and write for two hours in my classroom. Right. We get up, we do this, we do that. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so it's different. Um, so I've, I've talked to a couple of my students this week. I just talked to one before we did this and, um, I, I, you know, I just said, I, I'm, uh, this is what I'm doing to try to stay motivated. You can try this. What about you? Tell me how it's going. Be, and I think what it is, is the personal connection, right? I think that that's what is most important for them. If Ms. Valdez is, is going to check in on me, then, then I'm going to work on it. Right. But not because when I talked to him, I talked to him on Wednesday and I said, okay, let's try this. I'll call you on Friday. And, uh, and he said, I did all my work. Ms. Valdez. <laughs> I was like, okay, great. Uh, I'll check it in a little while, but good. What did you do to do all your work? And you know, how did you get motivated? Great. Yeah. I'm going to try that strategy because sometimes I have a hard time doing my work. And so just having a personal connection with them, I think has helped motivate, but it's really, really hard because they miss their, their friends. They miss their school. They miss their teachers. They miss their schedule. And it's really hard for, for them. Um, I mean, much harder than it is for us. So yeah, it is. And what would you suggest, uh, or what did you tell to the parents that are like struggling in, yeah, with, with dealing with all these, um, let's say, tasks that they have at home, plus the home um, activities, plus the uh, getting money for, for the food and yeah. working and, yeah. I tell them, take care of your family first. And if you get, if you read a book, fantastic. If you do this assignment, great. But your family needs to be okay first. This mm -hmm. is not a regular school year. It's not regular in any way. It's, it's once in every hundred years this happens, right? And um, so I tell them that what's most important is your safety, your health, and the health of your family. Once you have that, then you can, then you can write stuff, you know, or then you can do this math assignment. Mm -hmm. But don't sacrifice your well-being or the well-being of your kids for this because this is going to end and then we'll get back to what we need to do and we'll move forward from there. But um, yeah, it's a traumatic situation for everybody. And so I tell them, take care of your families and sure. we'll figure it out from there. <laughs> <laughs> and what would you say to other teachers not only because of these situations that we are uh, living right now but like in general uh, what uh, would you advise to other teachers that are maybe in a different context and dealing with difficulties or something like that um, what would you advise to them um there's a lot of things I think I would say um, celebrate who your students are when they walk into the classroom, celebrate their life, their culture, honor what they come to you. Don't look at them as not having, but look at what they do have and what they do bring. 
and embrace that. Um, I would say, um, I would say when we get back to school, hug as many kids as you can because you don't know when you'll get to do it again. Um, and I would say just um, know that, let's see, how do I say this? Know that what we do is an honor. It's important. So you made me cry again. God. It's an honor to be a part of their story. Even though a kid is really, really hard and is really hard to love, they're trying to tell you something about themselves with that and still love them. Oh, Carmela, thank you. Thank you for sharing your heart and thank you for sharing those words. And I think- I told you I was a you don't know, I'm sorry. <laughs> I think what you do is really important and I think that um, this connection you have with your kids and with the families is like um, it's something they will keep for the rest of their lives so you're being an important uh, piece for them in their lives and Thank I was yeah, I would like to read what what uh, you said in your in your CV that um, you believe that language is a civil right. That's very powerful. I think it's, it's true. It, I would like you to to share like your thought about this sentence. Why do you think a language is a civil right? Um. So, in the United States. Um, like I told you, my parents were denied their home language. Lots of other students were denied their home language. And, and there were many uh, court cases um, after that, not only to fight for equality and um, of students of color, but also to fight for equality in language. And I think that when people look at students who are, who come from a home that speaks a language other than English in the United States, um, they need to know that that student has a right to um, instruction or accommodations in their language, that it's a civil right to be able to have a classroom where you can be taught in your home language is a civil right. A lot of people um, try to strip that away from students and strip them to the majority language, which here is the in the United States is English, and try to go straight to all English because they think that that's better for the students. But you're stripping away their rights, their language, their connection to their culture and to their family. And um, I think that I think that's illegal. I just think that's wrong. So that's why I think that. Oh, thank you, Carmela, for this uh, beautiful conversation you, you have had with us. And thank you for your patience. It's been an honor oh to have gosh. you. So um, it has been beautiful and um, yeah, to hear you. Uh, is there something you would like to share with people or with um teachers or something uh enjoy the time you have with your students it's an honor to be with them and like we've just learned now like that could get taken away so cherish the time when you get frustrated cherish the time that you get to spend with them oh and then one um another question i would like to ask you before we finish yes, um what would uh, be the first thing you would do with your students when you see them again? Oh my gosh, I'm gonna squeeze them. I'm gonna hug <laughs> them so hard. And I'm just gonna hug them and tell them how much I miss them. And we're gonna sit and talk about all the things that they did and how they pet their dogs and how they walked and looked at flowers and how they uh, made cookies with their mom. We're gonna just talk about all mm -hmm. those things and I'm just gonna hug them. Thank you so much for being with us. And I think it's gonna... my, my pleasure. It's my no, pleasure. and I hope uh, we meet once in person. <laughs> yes, me too. Yeah, it's gonna be a pleasure. So thank you so much. I'm gonna uh, end the conversation 
here. And yeah, thank you. Thanks.